Hey, what's up? Jason here from Unity3D.College. Today we're continuing on with game programming patterns. We're going to talk a little bit about the type object pattern and the prototype pattern, but then we're going to focus more on a modified version of these that I actually use in real world cases that I think a lot of people use nowadays with uh, engines like Unity. So if you're used to storing all of your content and stuff in data form, either in files, like XML files, JSON files, or in scriptable objects, this may just be kind of a refresher for you. But if you're not, get ready, because we're going to cover some pretty interesting stuff. Now, if you haven't already seen the book, Game Programming Patterns, Robert's book is great. Definitely recommend you check it out. And the ones we're going to talk about today are Type Object and Prototype. But instead of just diving into the chapters and looking at what's there, I felt like it'd be a little bit easier to understand if I just go through some actual Unity C Sharp examples. So I've started with this nice little empty project here, semi-empty project, and I added a bit of code and some swords. You'll see in a moment. But we're gonna start with this first sword script. So imagine we've got a role-playing game, and in our role-playing game we've got maybe a dozen different weapons that our player can go pick up and attack enemies with. In that case, we may start off with something simple, just like a sword class. I named this one First Sword because I already had a sword. This is actually my second one. But this is our first implementation of it. So in our sword, it's a mono behavior, and we've got an attack method. The attack just takes a target, and targets can take damage. In fact, if we look at this target script, just hit F12 to go to it, you see that we can take damage, but we can also do some other things. We can get frozen and stunned, but our first sword doesn't really handle that well. So if we wanted to do anything different with our first sword, we'd have to go in and change the code. Now, it may be fine that our sword just needs to say, hey, you took damage, and then log out, hey, you sliced this thing. Now, imagine that this debug log is actually something writing to the screen, some, some sort of player feedback. But for now, we're putting it in debug because it's simpler to demonstrate and show. So then maybe I need to, I don't know, make a bigger sword. What do I do? Well, one way to do it would just be, let's see, let's copy this thing, paste it down, and make a big sword, right? We just make this big. It does 10 damage and says you um, really slice it. I don't know. So again, we'd have another class here for this different type of sword that has slightly different functionality. Oh, I'm getting an error here because I already named something big sword. I'm really good at naming things, right? So anyway, you can see that this obviously wouldn't work very well very long. Now, one option for this, and uh, something that kind of follows along the prototype pattern, although in a more Unity context, would be to just have a first sword and maybe take this damage part out. Maybe do like a public int damage equals one, and passing the damage here. And now we could make this into a prefab. So we'd have a first sword prefab, and then we could adjust the damage right there. We could even pull out this message and adjust the message right there, just in a game object in a prefab. And that, that would work. That's a kind of a unity representation of the prototype pattern. Instead of creating an object in code and instantiating it from making a copy of that, we'd use a prefab. But that's not really what I want to talk about. That's kind of basic, simple Unity stuff, right? So what are some other ways that this is done and other things that we can do? Well, let's take a look. First, I'm gonna get rid of this just to get rid of any compiler errors about my file names not matching. And then we're gonna go into our V1 folder. So one of the ways that this is done with the type object pattern, and this is a slightly modified version of it, is to just use an abstract class. So here we have a public abstract class that's a weapon. Abstract just means that it can't be instantiated. You can't create a new weapon. You can't go like var weapon equals new weapon. It'll tell you, hey, can't do that. Same with instantiate. We wouldn't be able to use game object dot instantiate on this. Instead, we have to use a subclass. So this is meant to just provide some base level functionality that all of the subclasses of the weapon will implement. So let's look at this class. Here we have our public void attack method, just like we had in the sword. Well, almost like it. 
Except here, instead of actually dealing damage directly to the target, we call this do attack method. And if you look here on line 11, do attack is actually an abstract method. So this means that this method needs to be implemented on all of the subclasses. So whenever we make another weapon, it will have a do attack that takes a target, and this is gonna call it and tell it to do whatever that was. Then on line eight, we do the same message logging, but here, we're again calling into another method instead of just pasting stuff in here. And this time we're calling into a virtual method that returns a string named damage message. So the reason we're using a virtual method here instead of an abstract one is because I want to give base level functionality to this weapon so that if we don't want to customize the damage message, we'll just get hit. But we can override the virtual one and change it if we want to. So if we want to have a different message, we could. In fact, let's take a look at some of those. So here you'll see I've actually got quite a few different classes. We've got a sword, a staff, a mega sword, a big sword, and an axe. Let's open up the sword. So in the sword, you'll see we inherit from weapon. We override the do attack method because we're required to. And then we also override the damage message and return back slash. So it'll say slash instead of hit. And in our do attack meth method, we're actually uh, what, taking five damage. And we can go look at like our big sword, similar. It does do attack, does 10 damage, and says devastate. Kind of cool. Still not very good, not great. It's definitely not any better than the prefab prototype method that we've covered so far. But let's take a look at some of the things that this does add. If we go into our mega sword, now you might notice that there's a little bit of functionality difference. So we're starting to see some things change. Our do attack now does 15 damage and has a 30% chance to stun and that's for two seconds. So here we're just getting a random number between zero and 100. If that number is 30 or less, so 30% of the time, then we'll run the code inside it and that just stuns this. And if we look at our staff, I think this one is doing a freeze and a take damage. So here you can start to see some of the advantages of this type object pattern where we can kind of customize the code, customize what it's doing for these different ones, but still use that abstract base class to handle the core functionality. Now let's see what this looks like in the editor. So we're gonna go over here. We have this V1 scene here. In here I've got a sword and a big sword. These are just game objects with the script. Um, and then I put a model underneath them. So there's a mesh underneath each one just to show them. Nothing special yet. In fact, I think they're, yep, they're the same mesh. And then we've got a weapon tester script that I'll show you in just a moment and our target. The target is just this ball with a target on it and no floating text. You'll see the floating text as we get a little bit deeper into the better versions of this pattern with a better example. And we've got our current health is set to 10. So if I hit play, let's just click, see what happens, and then I'll show you the code. So I click, hit play, We've got our target selected. I'm going to go to the console log. So I want to see these log messages. And I just click in here. And it says you slash target. And you may have noticed the current health went down. I'll click again. You'll see the health go down again. Went down. It went down. It went down. Good. So now, how is this working? Well, it's all in our weapon tester script. And in fact, let's swap out the sword real quick. See how we have a current weapon that's a sword? Let's put in the big sword. Drop it in there. Reselect the target. Because I just want to watch the health. And click. And now you see we're devastating our target and the health went down by 10 and it's going down by 10 each time I do that. So let's look at that code. Just show you what it looks like. It's really nothing special. Here you'll see that we have a weapon field, serialized field attribute, so it shows up in the inspector. We have our target, again, nothing special. And then in our update, we check for fire one, which is like our left click or the uh, with left control. And then we call current weapon, which is that one that's assigned, dot attack, and we pass in the target. So now it's relatively generic. Now you could imagine this would be, in a real world scenario, something that's on the player. Perhaps it's a script, a weapon attack script, or maybe part of a player script or something. Or some, some script in there that's reading, watching for this attack attempt making sure that you're allowed to actually attack, and maybe there's a refresh or something on the attack, and then calls this attack on the weapon against the target. And now we can kind of customize how that attack works just by swapping out the weapon. Now, of course, we wouldn't want to do that in the inspector in a real case. We'd want to have some weapon switching system, but that's a little beyond the scope of this example. So this is kind of okay. Like I said, it's it's got some extra functionality that we don't get just from the basic prototype prefab setup, but it's not really how I like to build things because 
who wants to go in and create a class for every single weapon? And this may work great if you have you know, a dozen weapons, like my initial statement. But what if you go up to 100 weapons? What if you go up to 200? What if you're building a game that's got thousands of weapons? This definitely won't work. You can't be creating a class for each one. And you definitely don't want to be going in there and recompiling and changing this stuff every single time. So you really want to try to get as much of this into some data format as possible. And that's where we're going with this. So we're going to go into our V2 version of the project right here. And here you can see we've actually got some text and some little characters, all that fun stuff. So let's hit play. I'm going to click show you that the functionality is still pretty similar and then show you how we've changed it to really clean things up and make it a lot more extensible. So here, I click, click, click. You see, his health is dropping by five. I didn't hook up any anim animations, but you can see the text going up. And if we select our skeleton grunt, you see that his health is dropping. There we go, it's dropping by five every time. Now to accomplish that, we're using the weapon tester again, but now we're passing in the knight instead of just a blank weapon. And that's because I put the weapon on our knight. So our knight now has this weapon v2 script. Very similar, just a slightly modified one. Let's see what happens if we swap this out though and how we swap it out. If you look here at our weapon v2, we've actually got a field for a model now and a field for weapon data. And if I click on it, you'll see that it's going to this sword scriptable object. If I wanna to switch to an ax, I can just drop the ax one in there. In fact, I can even disable and re-enable it and it'll swap out as model. Then I can click and you'll see that he's taking three damage and being stunned. Well, hopefully you can see that yellow stunned text going right up there. And I can also change it over to this magical mega staff. And again, to get the model to update right now, I have to disable and re-enable. It's just a side effect of not wanting too much code. And then I click and you'll see that we get the stunned. But I don't actually have to disable it to get the, the effect to change. All right, I can just swap that kind of out and click and it'll work fine. So I get the, get the other effect. So let's take a look at this code and see how it's different because remember, we're using scriptable objects now, we're not using a class for each weapon type. So here we go, let's open this thing up. So our weapon v2 script, a little bit different than our weapon. In fact, let's pull them up side by side. Let's grab that, let's see if I can grab it and pop it over here and get rid of some of this too. So we can just, just look at the code. Okay, so our original weapon script right here and our weapon v2 right there. Definitely a lot bigger, right? So let's look, our original weapon had an attack. We've got an attack, but we actually do things in our attack. And then, um, yeah, we didn't really have much else there. I guess there wasn't really much to compare, right? It's pretty empty. Let's look at this one. So we've got a weapon data, and this is actually a scriptable object. If I hit F12 and go to it, you'll see that it's just a scriptable object with five public fields. We've got damage, message, that's the text message that'll show up, the model that'll show up, a stun duration and a freeze duration. And then we've got the option to create scriptable objects from the menu. Adding this create asset menu with the menu name weapon data will make it so that it appears when I right click here, hit create, and now I've got weapon data right there. So what else is in here? Let's go back to our weapon v2. We've got a transform for the weapon models transform parent. Let's look at this. What is that set to? If you go right here, you'll see if I click on it, it's actually just an extra game object right where the hand goes, or right where the hand is facing in the direction that I want weapons to face. So this is essentially where the weapon will be in the person's hand or in the character's hand. And to get this point, I really just kind of drop a weapon there as a child, put it as a child of this, get it in position, and then save it off, and then leave that there in the right rotation and position, and assign it. Okay, so we've got those two things, and then we've got a game object for the model. We'll see that in a moment. So in on enable, we check to see if we have a model. If we do, we just destroy it. It's just so if we switch from an ax to a sword or whatever, we're getting rid of the old version. Ideally, we may wanna just disable them, but here it doesn't matter, we just destroy it. And then we instantiate the new one. Again, probably better to just instantiate and keep them around, but here, that doesn't make a difference. But the important part is this attack method. So in here, we weren't actually doing anything for our attack. In V2, our attack actually does a good amount of work because we no longer have subclasses that are dealing with all of the logic. Instead, we just have data. So our attack needs to read that data and then act on that data. 
So here you'll see that it checks to see if our weapon damage is greater than zero. If it is, we make the thing take damage. If stun duration is greater than zero, we make the thing get stunned. If freeze duration is greater than zero, we make it get frozen and so on. And you can imagine we could have any number of these different types of effects. Eventually, we may want to get to the point where we split off these effects into separate classes themselves if they're doing more than just setting a method on a thing. You know, if they're more than a one-liner, they're actually doing some logic in these different types of effects. I, I'd probably consider splitting them off. Of course, not if there's only three or five or six or something, but if we get to the point where there are quite a few, you may want to split these off and just separate it even more. But again, we're looking at the data, acting upon it, and then creating the message again from the data and logging it back out. Now, what are the benefits here? Well, the first one is I don't have to go in and change code if we need to make a change. If designers decide, hey, this med magical mega staff needs to be 20 damage, because I want to see what it feels like with 20 damage, they can just go in there and change that. Of course, they could do that with a prefab as well, but I'd much rather have them just changing scriptable objects than changing prefabs because they're less likely to break things if all they can do is adjust values in here. Of course, not saying that all designers are going to break things, but they generally feel more comfortable with uh, just giving them access to the things that you actually want them to change and try not to give access to things that shouldn't be changed outside of your, your code and engineering team. On top of that, they can create new ones. They want to create a new staff. Hey, no problem. Duplicate that staff. And we've got mag magical mega staff one or magical mega staff five, right? We'll use a V. Um, and then that could do a hundred damage and whatever it uh, crushes because it's actually a staff. Why is it slashing? And then has some other model here. I don't know. Let's see. Let's pick a uh, a neat model. Oh, I don't even have a staff model in here. Whatever. We'll use a mace. But I think you get the idea. Right now, our data is separated out from the logic and our code just uses that, runs with it. So we don't have to make changes. Now, what if you don't want to use scriptable objects? Well, to be honest, a lot of the time I don't use scriptable objects. If this is a bigger data-driven game, I may end up using another remote data store, some database or some API calls to actually get this data. And if we look at the weapon data class again, Remember, it's just a very, very basic class with five fields. As long as we can get these from somewhere else, and we may not be able to get the model from somewhere else because it's a game object, we won't have that reference, but we could do something like a public string model name, and then in our weapon v2 code, just look for that model by name and instantiate it instead of needing the reference. So what we can do is just take this class, make it not a scriptable object, maybe serialize it out to JSON or XML or whatever format you like, and then load that in as well. And in that case, we actually don't have to worry about builds at all. Data can just be completely changed and reloaded without any need for any engineering work at all, I guess. So you don't have to go in there and change scriptable objects and play in the editor and run if that's not something that your designers are doing can have a totally separate editing tool for this stuff. Now, if your designers are working in the engine all day anyway, just use a scriptable object, unless it's gonna get to the point where it's unmanageable and you're gonna have you know, maybe dozens or hundreds of these things and you wanna have some other format for them. But if you can use scriptable objects, I, I'd go that way. If not, a data service or something else will work fine too. Anyway, I hope this is a little bit helpful for you. Like I said, the type pattern and prototype pattern as they're written in the book, aren't really that commonly used nowadays just because memory is a bit more abundant and there's just a lot more data going in. So we try to keep that stuff out of code as much as possible. But I still highly recommend that you just go check out the book. I've got a link below and read through those chapters. You can really understand the different problems that they're trying to solve and how this solution can solve at least quite a few of those problems. All right, uh, thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. I'm gonna hit a bunch more of these game programming patterns from the book and outside the book over the next couple weeks. So if you're interested in that stuff, just make sure you're checking back. All right, thanks again. Keep coding.